Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we back with another week of STI 740 Beyond the Game. There's a name change. And before we start, I like to say to everybody who's here and helps work out, help with the show, I like to give a big thank you to everyone because without y'all, the show is nothing. Brandon, Miss Valerie, DJ Don D, Miss Rachel, yeah. our producer. Man, without y'all, the show is nothing. And y'all taking time out y'all schedule to help us help the community. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, get well, Cameron. Get well, the Cameron. He's sick. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Cameron been out for a few days. But yeah, we'll be happy when he get back. But yeah, like Isaac said, we want to just thank everybody out there who helping us, the camera guys, and all of our guests who come out every single week. So. Yeah, the show's ran by you, produced by you. Even got. We even got a youth, a young man right here. Maybe it's kind of ugly, but it's still ran by you. So, Jabari. Do it beautifully. Yeah. Do your best. Good job. So, let's go ahead and go into this Hold up, sports. Man. Hold on. Can I introduce myself, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Hey, my name is Brother Savion Curd, also known as Savvy GQ, hosting your talent segment. And I'm the hype man, too. You might want to introduce yourself. But yeah, I'm your co-host today, Brother Jabari Garrett. But what, what we got for today? All right, today for sports, we got Oregon wide receiver Darren Carrington. He is ineligible for the game, the championship game against Ohio State because he was caught smoking weed when he didn't pass the test. I really, honestly, weed legalized in Oregon and he's a young college kid. And a lot of people call him, oh, he's selfish, crazy, stupid. But you're in college, young, dumb, and young. You wanna try things, and I'm pretty sure there's people doing a lot worse things, a lot worse things than he is. So honestly, to me, I ain't got nothing against him. I mean, like when you get to that level, like when your team about to go to the championship, like, you still need to, like, keep yourself back. You don't want to be involved in nothing. So, I mean, like, this is a big game. And, like, I'm thinking that Oregon can probably still win, but they don't want to take their chances. They don't want to lose nobody. So, I mean, like, he should have been smart enough to, like, know, like, stay out of trouble. Like, don't get himself, like, his name put in anything. But what I don't get is why he's getting ineligibly taken out of the game when it's legal in Oregon. I mean, it's not like, it's not legal or he's too young like our age or something but honestly well, I don't get it. I think that's like the NCAA rules like I don't think you can um, like be on like you can't have any kind of drugs but still like the um, Jeff Green I mean uh, what's his name Darren Carrington I mean he's still like like I said he needs to like keep himself out of trouble he's a great receiver and Oregon Probably could use him in a game. Yep, they could use him. They lost their tight end and another wide receiver who was hurt on the open kickoff of the Rose Bowl. He's the number two receiver. He's first. He's second in connection percentage with Marcus Mariota, 73.5%. And first in yards per attempt, 14.3. So I think they're really going to need him. So honestly, he messed up, but. And then you know, like you know, like refs and stuff, like whoever's over the NCAA, they always gonna try to find something to penalize you, especially when you're making it to the championship. They gonna wanna take away your advantages. So like, if they can find something small that you did, they gonna take it away from you. So. So you saying it's fixed? I mean, you can't say that because I mean, like it's close. It's a big game, and like if you do something small, they gonna point it out. So. Yep. Yep. It's a lot more pressure. The bigger game. So Jeff Green and Tayshawn Prince have traded teams. Jeff Green went to the Grizzlies. Tayshawn Prince went to the Celtics. The Celtics got Tayshawn Prince's $7.7 million contract and a first round pick for Jeff Green. I think that's really going to help out the Memphis Grizzlies, but I think the Grizzlies really have to lock up Jeff Green since this is Jeff Green's contact, contract year. So, and I think it's really going to help them because really the only thing they were missing was a good starting small forward. They have Marcus Gasol, Tony Allen, 
Mike Conley, and Zebo. So I think they're, they're pretty good in the West, but it's loaded and anybody can get hurt. Yeah, I mean, I believe you. Because, like, when you get it, but still, like, the Memphis Grizzlies are in the West. So if you get a stacked team, I mean, you got people who can play each position. But still, I mean, you might have a good team, but don't mean you're going to go anywhere. I mean, the West is a great conference. So, I mean, if the Grizzlies can, like, get their team play together, team chemistry, they have a chance to do something and make it to the playoffs. But, I mean, I still don't see them making oh, it. Oh, no doubt they're going to the playoffs. Really? Yes. Do you realize how much of a challenge they gave the Thunder and other teams in the West? And Jeff Green is really just an upgrade over Tayshaun Prince. And their bench is doing pretty good, if you ask me. But like I said, I mean, the West Conference, the Western Conference is, like, still really, really tight. I mean, even good teams still don't sometimes don't make it because, I mean, like, you have the Spurs, you have OKC, Trailblazers, you have, um, I mean, you just have a lot of teams. I mean, the Suns, I mean, going drag, drag it, it yeah. he's doing great this season, too. So, I mean, like, you have a lot of people who's, like, good in the Western Conference. Yeah, because even the Thunder, they're 18 and 19. They won last night when they acquired Dion Waiters from the Cavaliers in a three-team trade. So I think the teams that may have a chance of getting in, Grizzlies, Thunder, if they pick up their play, because they lost two in a row when they were shooting horribly. That the team, the two games they lost, it was by a combined 54 points. So, yeah, like, that's not good. I don't think that's not really I think, good. I think what they have to do, I think they have to really pick up their play and get a lot better. I mean, like, do you think the Thunder can, like, pick up their play, though, like, yeah. at this point of the season? They got Kevin Durant. I mean, just because they got one player, who else they got? Russell Westbrook. Yeah, it's, keep going. Reggie Jackson. I mean, I still don't, I don't, I don't Deion like, Waiters. The, I don't like, Deion Waiters didn't do nothing at the Cavs. Yeah, 15 he points. He didn't do nothing. 15 points last night. And he had a three that put the, Thunder up by four. That's one game, though. I mean, like, I still don't like the way Deion Waiters play, so I think, like, the Thunder straight. I mean, you may not I, I don't like think him, but good. they're still pretty good. You may not like him. No, I don't think they're going to do anything. You may not like him. We're going to have to get, we're going to have to see at the end of the season. Yeah, we sure will. I don't think we sure gonna, will when the Thunder are in the playoffs. I mean, I think they might make it to the playoffs, but might, I mean, I don't think they might. can do nothing. Dude. They've only played five, All right, so five, seven games. When I'm saying that, I don't think they're going to do nothing. I mean, like, get to the championship. I don't think they're going to make it there. I mean, I think they can make it to the playoffs, but no, I don't think they're going to no. make it to the championship. They beat the Spurs without Kevin Durant. Also, but nothing against the Spurs. They don't have Kawhi Leonard. But really, Dude. the only shot maker that you had at the time, Reggie Jackson and Russell Westbrook. And I think Deion Waiters really going to help the second bench with scoring. Man, I don't know about He's that. He's averaging 15.8 points. I guess we'll just have to find out about that. Yeah, we sure will. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and go to this commercial break. DJ Dog B, take us out. Oh. Oh, man. I think you come up with Oh, you know you can drink the head of it if you want to. All right, you
this guy. We got this time we got a guy. He got on green too, so it kind of fits it. We call him Highlighter or AKA Hulk. <laughs> so you see, his veins are like really popping out. So it's like, boom. <laughs> I mean, he's big. No, I looked at the videos. That cornerback on the floor passed out. It looked like it. That's it made it look like torture. Yeah. <laughs> it's not torture, my friend. It's hard work, and hard work pays off, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Don't forget that. Still look like torture. <laughs> it feels on the floor, passed out, sweating. I mean, it looked like he just got back from getting out of swimming pool. Well, it was his first day, you know. He had to go through an eight minute workout, as everybody does when they join Paul Cardio. And it's not easy. Everybody has to do it, you know. It's eight minutes. He made it, I think, halfway through it. And he was on the floor like he was on that, on that video. <laughs> well, y'all work out like eight minutes long. Y'all work out like eight minutes long? No, the first workout's eight minutes and it's rough. It's just a trial to test you to see where you are. And he had to go through that workout, and he didn't make it. Nobody has ever made it. So that's all. You, you never made it? No, I'm uh, still working on that. I'm just, still trying to get better. He just said nobody has ever made it. Come on. I didn't ask you. But the, come on, Jamar. Yeah, let's get into this. So, I mean, I know this, but others might not know this. Like, I understand that you were probably bullied when you were younger, and like we're having a round table about this with the youth later on in the show. So, please explain, like. How did that feel for you? Like, how did you feel? It felt really bad. You know, I was really hurt a lot when I was younger, and I was pushed around, and I was told I couldn't do anything, and that really motivated me. That's why you see me now standing, standing before you guys as big. You know what I'm saying? And I like to work out because of that. It motivated me a lot, and my dad and everybody else, my family members, helped me push through all that stuff. And here you see me today, a strong young man, looking to. Uh, Pursue my career and keep going on my life. So, when you were bullied, were you like a walking stick or something? <laughs> yes, I was. I was, a, I was skinny. I, uh, I was smiling at you, man. I think you were bigger than me, man. Huh? I was taller than you, though. But, yeah. You think you probably bigger than me, too, man? I like what you. age? No, I was probably your size. I was probably your size. Like what age? I was 14 years old. When you started getting bullied or when it ended? Uh, it ended about Roughly about my mid 15 and 16, that's when I really started committing myself to working out and I started getting bigger. And then everybody just saw me like the summer I came from school, everybody just looked at me like, oh, he's big, I'm not messing with him. And I was like, all right, I did my job and that's how I wanted to do. So that's why I went to working out? Uh, I, I just work out to just, I love it now. I fall, I fell in love with it. This is what I do. I, I like to stay in shape and be the best I could be in fo football and uh, really compete at the highest level I can. So other than that little situation of the bullying, like now that you say you love your, um, you love working out, like what was the motivation? The motivation really was um, seeing my dad and him pushing me all the time and the people that, that are in a, uh, a facility that work out with us, they we push each other and I always try to like compete with my dad, get as strong as he is. That's all I wanted to do when I was young. I wanted to be strong like my dad and be, uh, be like him one day, and I think I'm coming up on that. So, you said you want to be strong like your dad. Are you stronger than him? Strong, as strong, a little bit under? Well, we can we can let him be the judge of that. You know, he sees me in the way him every day. You know, and we in there working out, we in there getting big, we making gains. You know, I let him be the judge of that. I like for him to say, say it himself live here on the 740. You heard it. Show that I'm the strongest power car you has to offer. <laughs> You see those guns right there? They weren't made overnight. So, um, for those who don't know, like, where did you come from and, like, what made you start playing college ball? I come from, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Um, I went to high school in Arlington Bowie. My dad, um, I, I was usually a wrestler. My dad pushed me to play football, and I always played football. I just never really got really serious into football until my dad pushed me to play. And I played, I fell in love with it, you know, I played defensive end for uh, Friends University in Wichita, Kansas. Y'all look for us, we're doing big things. And he just pushed me and pushed me, all my friends pushed me and I did a very good job. So, how important was it for you to have your dad there when you were growing up? It was very important, because not many people in the world today have their parents to push them and help them go go along with their life. And you know, my dad has always been there. All my parents have always been there and uh, pushed me. And that's why you see me today. I'm strong and I'm healthy and I thank my parents for that. So, what is college ball like? And are you ready to go pro? You think I can tell you right now, I'm ready to go pro right now. 
Really? I'll call you, get you ready for anything in life. And you guys, if you guys want to work out, I'll let me. I mean, why you get your number? Show yourself. I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man. You know what? We might have to do that. You know, you too, man. What's up? Man, I, uh, if you keep on, I might try to be stronger than you one day. I don't know about that. I mean, I don't think anybody can be stronger than me. Better I tell think me. I can. Yeah. You better tell. I think it is. Like, I'm gonna the gun me? show right now. You see, who got the biggest guns. You know, because when I start, I think my guns are a little bigger than both of y'all. Yeah. But yeah. But you've been working out on it. I mean, you've been a couple. Too much. I need. I'll be looking like life can't hold. That's not two weeks. Time. You need about years. I think I'm about roughly 18 years in strong. And look at this. Look at that. Yep. That ain't nothing bigger. compared to me. That's bigger than your head, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm sorry to say, it's bigger than your head. Ain't much bigger than his head. <laughs> well, you know, I'm still growing. So you can't just look at me now and say, okay, you're big, because I'm still growing. I'm just gonna keep growing and get bigger, because that's what I do. So why is it every time you move your muscle, it look like you flexing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, you know, have you ever seen a cripple hog walk around? Oh, yeah. You know, you just, you know, the muscles just go around, go with the motions. I mean, it's just like, you know, your hair when it moves. I mean, you just walk around and stuff just moves, you know, it's just something like that, you know. If you're a little bit moving. taller, I can see you playing a Hulk in the Avengers. <laughs> I think I gotta do this paint you green. Or a bigger Hulk. I think I'm bigger than him. So? I mean, I got the green, yellow shirt. What do you think? I don't think you are. Uh, you don't think so? No. They're going to need to add some graphics on that. <laughs> oh, oh, it's like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not green. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not green. So, yeah, you're right. So, you said these workouts get you strong, get your muscles pumping. Yes. Can we get a demonstration? You want a demonstration? Yes. Yeah. I do. You want to, Do 740 want a demonstration? Yes, 740 wants a demonstration. Yeah. Let's get a demonstration. Let's be a demonstration. Um, I can show you a little something right now. Well, we'll do your demonstration after we come back off a of commercial. You know? Be ready. Everybody right, stay. Yeah. So, DJ Doc D, take us out.
Alright, so we're about to have this demonstration that he said he can do power cardio. See what they're showing us. Let's go. This is called tricep kick out. It's going to work your body, the tri, the traps, and your core. Alright, here we go. Come on, 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 come And that's what we do all the time. I I work out probably about eight minutes a day, and it takes no time to do it at home with your wife, with your uh, husband, kids, anybody together. Okay? All right. Yeah, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have to give a little bit of time. Yeah, that's a great job. All right. So that's it. We're going to commercial break. I'd like to thank you. Wow, man. man, you're tall. <laughs> you know, you got some going to do, so you might get a little. Yeah, I might, like, right there. Might have to pick you up. All right, so we're going to commercial break. Digi.D, take us out. That's the easier ones? And yeah, that's one of the easier ones. We have harder workouts, so, you know, that didn't make all this right here. You thought that made this? Nah. It made some of it, but it didn't make all of it. You know? Yeah, I don't think I can do that anymore. Nah, you no, know, I'm backing down from the challenge. I'll let him do it. You got it. Yeah, you're the big man. You gotta be fit, man. He's a big man around town. 740 show, you know you gotta let people see your, your muscles. You can't wear sweaters all the time. I know it's cold, but you gotta pop out the short sleeve. Yeah. Burst through it like when you hope you want to hope for him, get mad. Yeah, I think I didn't know this though. <laughs> huh? Okay, don't okay. challenge hope. Don't on this. All right, so what's your short and long and long term goals? <sighs> short term, long term. I'm talking long term. Right my, long, my long term goal is um, like this is how just complete everything in my life with football and sports and uh. Help my dad out in the gym, help train people, and uh, get the get the youth ready, get the little young kids ready. And uh, the NFL is my dream, so I'm just training real hard to, get, to uh, catch my dream and compete in the highest level in the NFL. So how important was it for your dad to be in your life? It's very important. Like like kids, kids don't have that. Kids don't have nobody to push them. Kids need somebody to push them and tell them what's right and what's wrong. You know, m mothers can do it too, but dad's dad's a very, very, very strong person that you got to have in your life, and uh, a lot of people don't have that. That's why I'm like, I'm thinking for my dad. If it wasn't for my dad, I wouldn't be this big. I wouldn't be working out today, <laughs> I don't think. And uh, he's pushed me in a lot of ways, and I'm very thankful. And uh, yeah, you really need a father figure in life so far. So can you give us a list of people who have benefit benefited from the power cardio? The list is so long, man. I can. I, the list is very long. So many people, so many people. My dad trains, and a lot of people that made gains in life lost weight. There's people that lost 40 pounds in a the week. There's people that gained 20 pounds in a week. There's people that's made so many gains. The list is, goes on and on, man. We can be here. I don't know how long the show is. I can just tell you right now, and then we, the show will be over. I will stay with time. So, yeah. You know, you know, our show is about an hour long. It is. It's all long. Yeah. Oh, we'll be here all day then. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll be here all day talking about people because a lot of people, their lives have changed. My dad has saved lives over and over again. My dad has changed lives. And that's something I want to do too. So, power cardio is like for everyone men, women, children. Everybody. Cats, dogs, everybody. <laughs>
<laughs> Everybody get in shape. Animals do. <laughs> so what makes Bert happy? Um, just um, being in touch with my family and uh, coming to see, see my family. Family makes me happy, man. Family makes me happy and my true friends. But family's number one. Like, uh, and, and working out every day. It's something I love to do. And I just really love my family and uh, the people that care about me most. So, like, other than your dad, like, do you have any of your other family members working with the power cardio with you? My little brother does it. Uh, uh, my other little, everybody. Oh, man. I had, uh, my mom, she tries to pitch in every now and then. We know women, they like to eat. So, you know, it's the holidays. You know, I don't know. The, the belly has got to get right. But, you know, <laughs> it's so many people, man. <laughs> so, what type of person would others say Bert? Bert. You know, very motivated, and I push myself, so I'm very, I'm very, 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 like, willing to learn from anybody. You know, I'm not just uh, a big guy who's just like, okay, I know everything. I like to learn, and I don't, you know, I just, uh, I just like to keep learning and keep getting better in life and uh, and everything I do, sports, working out, uh, whatever else I want to do in life, I just like to learn, and because uh, life goes on, and you just got to keep pushing. So... You said you wanted to talk about Floyd Mayweather. Yes. Right? The money team. All right, we can go. What you got to say about him? Floyd Mayweather is the best boxer, pound for pound, in boxing ever. Number one, he's a little guy. He's a little guy. Don't get me wrong. He's a little guy. But let me tell you something about Floyd. He worked hard all his life. He works hard for every fight. He's beating the best lightweights. He's beating everybody that is to beat. Pacquiao has nothing. On Floyd Mayweather. Okay, okay. I, I agree with you. The money team. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Said nothing on I it. agree with you with Pacquiao. But best boxer ever does really some good boxing. Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson before he bit the ear. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw this one ask you a question. Um, where they, I'm not saying that they weren't good fighters because Muhammad Ali and those guys were awesome fighters. Big guys. Tell me a lightweight who's who's fought in other divisions and and has done the things Floyd has done. Helped his community and everything, and just help people and 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 just he's undefeated. Tell me anybody. Well, I'm sorry, can't give you nobody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I win. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have nothing on the other boxes. I just think Floyd Mayweather has shown and proved to everybody over and over again by fighting the other guys. The other guy he just fought and beat. Everybody thought he was gonna lose to and. He's just, he's just an amazing fighter, and I respect him. Wow. Well, I mean, now we had it from you. We heard it from everybody. We saw their, their workout, that intense workout. So, I mean, now we're about to go to our little youth round discuss table. So, I mean, DJ Doc D, take us out. Okay, so we back. There's a technical difficulty. I don't say no names. But we're going to go ahead and bring up our football starter, a.k.a. entrepreneur, if you ask me. Start his own thing, do his own business. Helping out the community. And that's what we need to see more. More African-American men dealing with kids, helping the community. I mean, he stands for everything that you could want from an African-American. Man. So let's go ahead and bring up Mr. Andre. How you doing? Good to meet you. I'm good to meet you. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. It's a pleasure to be here. So how does it feel to know that you're having a positive influence on the kids in your neighborhood? Well, it, it feels great. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, uh, something that I've always wanted to do. You know, something that something I've always wanted to do, you know, but given uh, my upbringing from a rough side of town, you know, I feel like if I could just influence one kid out of many, you know, I've done my job, especially for a young black man, you know, considering the fact that we have a lot of uh, uphill battles in our lives, so I figured that as long as I can make an impact, we'd be okay. So, what's the name of the football team that you started? The name of the football team is called the Spartans, kind of like Michigan State, and we just kind of took on the mantra. You know, we just kind of took on the mantra, and uh, 
you know, and things of that nature. So we just kind of patting ourselves after them a little bit. Well, you know, I've been wanting to know, like, how y'all football team doing? Like, how did they do? Our football team did good this year. You know, we uh, we we have since our inception. You know, we've had a few championships and. Uh, We've done, uh, you know, a lot of positive things because in my in our football team, when me and the owner started, me and the other co-founder, Aaron Holt, shouts out to him, we started this thing. We started something. We didn't want it to be just about X's and O's. So when you ask us how we're doing, you know, we have many areas, you know, for us extracurricular, for us ac academic and things of this nature. So in other words, to answer your question, bro, we're doing really good. <laughs> so how long have you been coaching? Uh, this year I've been coaching 20 years. You know, I've actually been coaching 20 years, and we started this team in 2008. And uh, it's been it's been a journey, man. I've seen I, I coached at a time when uh, back then I played for the Comets. So you know, I coached when uh, I coached on the, on the time when the other leagues outside of the Pop Warner was just starting. You know, so I, I got a hold of one of those leagues, and that's been about 20 years ago. It'll be 20 years this year, actually. So, what are the ages that you coach? The ages we range from on the Spartans is age from four to 12. You know what I'm saying? So we have some people that actually started. As a matter of fact, I had brought one of the young men, our athletes, with us that started at the age of four. Can we bring him on? Yeah, bring him up here. Oh, man. My man Dylan, man. He got, <laughs> he's our uh, running back on our C team. He started when he was four years old. Now imagine, he used to just cry, cry, cry. Am I right? Yes, sir. Put the mic up. Yes, and he, sir. he used to just cry all the time. Now he's seven years old. So now he's running 20 and, and, and 30 and 50 yard touchdowns now. So we try to develop him when they're at an age of the formative years. So he was one of the four year olds. So he's going to graduate from our program also. So, how do you like playing for this team? Uh, I like playing for it. And um, it's a good team. And. Um, that all I have to say. Oh, man. <laughs> all we have to say. <laughs> Short and sweet. Yeah. So, um, like, I have a question for you. Like, how many, have you won any championships with this team? Uh, yes, when I was in flag, though. We went to the Super Bowl. Oh, good. The Super Bowl. And how you like him being your coach? <laughs> good. <laughs> he pushed me really hard. So. Good answer. No. <laughs> Do you start? I, I, I hope you say yes. You start, right? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> Call me Ivy. <laughs> Call me Ivy. So, who who do you compare yourself to as a running oh, back? That's DeMarco Murray. Oh. <laughs> and I'm 29. 29, right. <laughs> so I'm guessing you're a little cowboy fan. Yes. When I said DeMarco Murray, Dude, he wasn't a cowboy fan. I like a lot of players and I'm not their team fan. I, so, I know that, but come on, Jabari. So just, just leave yeah. that right there. Leave that right there. Use your brain. Leave that right there. This dude. We yeah. right so there. like, um, y'all season, like, what was y'all season record? Um, eight and eight. Help him out. So they went all the way, this year, they went all the way to the third round. I think I'm, I'm going to say third round of the playoffs, the game right before the Super Bowl. They did pretty good. They had, a, you know, a pretty, yeah, pretty good coaches, man. I gotta give it up to the coaches we have and the, uh, the guys we have on the team, just kind of helping them out. So they had a pretty good year. So I mean, they, but since he's been coaching, they've always had good. I mean, playing, they've always had good years. So we had a pretty good year this year. Well, I know I used to play like Pee Wee Lee when I was younger, and like when you Pee Wee, younger? yeah. Look, look, well, I mean, but so like we play both sides of the field though. So like, did you play on defense? Yes. What position? Um, linebacker, Jabari. Let me, I'm gonna tell you some. What you got bro. to say now? There's a difference between playing and sitting on the pine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Boy, you I, can say, I stayed on the you field. Can say I stayed you on the watch field. Watch them. Play. No, no, no. You just. You say you stayed on the field. I stayed on the field. Stayed on the field. Everything, special teams. Before, or after the, before, during, or after the game. During the game, I stayed on the field. Oh, like halftime. <laughs> this boy got jokes, don't he? Got he? Serious jokes. <laughs> what position did you play? When I played, I played receiver and cornerback. Receiver and cornerback. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Oh, think he got game. <laughs> got game. I got better game than you. Wow. You're bigger, but I don't say he, he didn't deny it, though. Bigger, but you're not <laughs> I mean, better. he didn't deny it, though. You're not better. I didn't deny you, it. You think and they I didn't deny it like twice. You, can you look at him and tell they got game? You think they got game? I think he got game. Oh, oh. 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 He said he think I got game. Wow. Oh. Okay. Okay, it's like that? 
<laughs> you supposed to be on my side. <laughs> good. Nah, you did good. Good job. So I mean, like, do y'all do any like fundraisers, like car watches or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, the thing about uh, uh, my uh, the organization that me and uh, Aaron started, we our thing was we started the organization basically to inst to reestablish integrity among little league football. Because sometimes you have a lot of dads that they like to live out their child, they like to live out their NFL dreams and their children. You know what I'm saying? And we didn't want that. Not only did we want that, we didn't want all the coaches fraternizing with all the team moms and stuff like that. We pretty much want some integrity. So we do fundraisers, we do things that help out in the community. We have helped uh, people. We have helped people like when their houses burned or, or when they needed help. We we come together as a family. We pretty much been a family from our inception. So we do a lot of things in the community. That's why I say the Spartans are not just about X's and O's. We're about bringing men up and bringing them up the right way and teaching them how to be young men. So part of teaching them how to be young men is getting out in their community and letting them know you're there, number one, and also letting them know that you truly care about your life and your upbringing and the, and the guy behind you. So what has been the hardest thing? You had a question? <laughs> you don't have any? None at all? Did he just do like a workout or something? He's probably still a little tired. So, you know. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, what has been the hardest thing to achieve in Pee Wee football? I think um, the hardest thing that it has, the, the hardest thing to, have to, to, to achieve has been like to get some of the parents to realize, um, you know, when you're in trust, the way the community is today versus back when I was a kid. Um, the, the parents entrusted their youth, they entrusted their kids to the coaches. So when you were with them at that particular time, you belonged to the coaches. You belonged to the coaches. The parents just sat back. And I think the hardest thing is to uh, get the men and the parents to understand that we are a bunch of people that really have your child's best interest at heart. So while they're on that football field, let us take it and we'll handle it from there. So the hardest thing, so it hasn't been really hard, nothing's been really hard, but that's one of the most difficult. But so, we're getting there, we're getting there. Do you have a son that plays on the team? No, actually I don't have any sons. I have uh, daughters. Uh, I have a 14-year-old daughter and I have a 6-year-old daughter. But I've never had any boys or uh, sons. Uh, so basically, uh, I have, right now I have like 75 sons, I guess you could say. You know what I'm saying? But as far as biological sons, no. So do you like, like coaching the older boys or the younger boys better? Well, um... Watch out, he right <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, when you say older version, you mean like the younger boys like him versus the 12 year olds? Or yeah. No, I mean, it, it's either all to me. See, with the older boys, you can kind of get them in. You know, you could be a little bit hands on with them. And I don't mean hands on, but I mean hands on with them, pretty much let them know how life is coming after us. You know what I'm saying? Because right now, when I went to Fellowship Christian Athletes, I played for East Texas State University for all four years, you know what I'm saying, on the scholarship. I, didn't, I had no desire to go to the NFL. I just wanted my education free. So as long as you're paying for my education, I was going to hit whoever had the ball. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and then I went to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Oklahoma State University. And they taught us that while we were there, you were in a bubble. And so once you leave that bubble, you know, you get, you're subjected to everything that's going on. So basically what happened was when you have the older guys versus the younger guys like Dylan, he's still in his formative years. And by him being in his formative years, you can pretty much bring him up the right way and kind of mold him and shape him the way he's supposed to be. But you can't mold him and shape him the way he's supposed to be if you're not the way you're supposed to be. So that's the thing about it. So for, uh, your old versus young, I would say the best time is to get them when they're very young, like when they're four in the flag and just bring them on up through the program. Because we got guys that are 12 that are about to be 13 now that are graduating through the program. And they look back and they still call us coach. They, even though they go to different high schools and junior high, they still wear their, their uh, jackets and things of this nature when we provide for them when they graduate. So it's a mixture. But I'll say I'd rather, I prefer getting them out of young. Know. I mean, no, like, you answered the question great. I mean, like, you love, like, playing with all the boys. Right. You, you like to get them when they're younger. It's like, you like to bring them up, so. Yeah, because my dad passed when I was 12 years old, and I'm a product of Dixon Circle, Trey Five Seven Crips. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you don't ever get out of that situation. You know what I'm saying? You just basically have to move out of that situation. So uh, what what changed my mind as far as a young man is I just got tired of seeing my mother cry in the back of the courtroom when I would take her to court, uh, and she was crying and waving at me like everything was going to be all right when I know I was slowly killing her. So I had no desire to coach kids. You know what I'm saying? None. But a friend introduced me to. Her. I was like, man, I ain't coaching no little boys. 
you know what I'm saying? Then in 94, 95, when he introduced it to me, I loved it so much because these guys looked at me and I feel like I can be an impact. And I'm like, man, they look up to me. So I left that lifestyle and I got with these kids and they've been my inspiration ever since. And then when I met Mr. Holt, Edwin Holt, uh, we had the same common goal in mind and we just put it together, man, and we've been rolling ever since, man, for these boys, you know what I'm saying? So what are, the other, what are some of the other things you gotta do when you're not coaching? Well, when, when we're not coaching, uh, we, we, both the, we both the business owners, you know, uh, Aaron owns XMP Productions, you know, which is a media situation. I own Backdrop Sound Productions, which is an audio company, and also I'm a gospel recording artist, so that's what I do. But as far as the kids, we're doing something with them all year long. We have camps, like in May uh, of every year, we have our uh, Patrick Creighton Skills Camp, you know, where he, Patrick Creighton is a nice friend of ours, and he brings his friends, and we all get together, and it's free. So anybody can come. You know, we our first couple of years we charged for it. And then we was like, man, this is making such an impact on the kids. Just make it free, man. So we have people from high schools that come, people from junior high, people from other teams have brought their whole team. So we just always out in the community, man, just giving back, having fun. You know what I'm saying? So do you have like a no plat, no pass, no play? Yes, this sir. Year? And that's what I was talking about when I say it's more than about X's and O's. Because we check grades, and, the, we, and this was the vision of me and Aaron. You know, we wanted to make sure we had a real team that's going to thrive, not just a bunch of cats that put something together that's just going to be around for three and four years. We're going into our seventh year, and we check grades. We do all of this. And if you don't pass, your parents bring you to us, and we handle it. And that's how we do it. And if we've had guys, even our star running backs, or uh, things of this nature, we, we're not favorites. We don't take favorites. You know, if you didn't take, it, if you didn't take care of your business at school, you didn't play. And I mean, I know sometimes we have some people, you know, our kids, they get mad, they get upset, but at the same time, this is what we want to instill in them. Hey, man, this is extracurricular. This is a privilege. It's not a right for you to be in any of these, any of these things. So, yeah, we, we can take great pride in that. Man, it's deep. No it pass, is deep. No, no pass, no play. I hated it when I was in school, but, you know, I come up when, you know, Mark White, Governor Mark White, that's who instituted that law in Texas. No pass, no play. But... I didn't have a problem with that because I always passed. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. It made the kids want to do better in school, too. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And the thing about it is, uh, like my, my man here, you know, Dylan, uh, he's, a, he's a very good kid. He takes care of his business. And we have all of our kids. You know, you have some that you have to mold a little bit more than others. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, we don't ever give up on them. But if you don't take care of your books, if you don't take care of your academics, because that's the main thing that's going to get you over, that's how it goes. You know what I'm saying? So we just got to take care of that. Yeah, okay. So now we'd like to thank you. So I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, huh? And now we're going to have our who's who in the community, Mr. Kevin Cates. Hello, Mr. Kale. Hello. Hey, how you doing? All right. So before we go, before we do the Who's on the Community, we would like to introduce the producer of Big Time Names, T.I. is just one of the various artists that I'm pretty sure he's done. And his rap sheet is pretty good. I mean, he's in Atlanta right now, so he's not going to be here. So we're doing a phone call with Mr. Kale. And we would like to go ahead and introduce... Mr. K.O. Kate. What's happening? How y'all doing? How you doing? Doing great, doing great. How about you guys? We doing good. So can you tell us, tell us, like, what was life like for you growing up? Life for me growing up, um, it was, um, you know, I, I was, um, raised in Montgomery, Alabama. So as a, you know, aspiring artist and producer, it was, I kind of walked to my own tune, uh, my own beat. And um, because making it in, in the music business, shot coming out of Alabama was like a far-fetched dream. Like it wasn't supposed to happen. So I had a lot of people always tell me what I wasn't going to be able to do. and. Um, how I was chasing a dream and wasting my time and it really just made me have to really block it all out and just go even harder to, you know, 
to make it out. So did that just like inspire you even more? You know it did. It made me it made me um I think it built my character up to another level. Um, you know, anytime you have somebody telling you what you can't do, either one or two things is gonna happen, you're gonna believe them or you're gonna, you know, take it to the next level. So it really made me stronger. So do you have any siblings and which one was closer to you and why? You know, I was the only boy growing up. I had, um, you know, found that I had a brother later on, but um, I had um, I had four sisters, and I would probably say my my sister Kirsten, who's a year, two years younger than me. We were probably close, close because we, you know, just growing up and um, you know, me just being that big brother and looking out for her. So we um. I went to the same schools and stuff like that. So I would probably say the two of us. So, like, when you're growing up, I mean, I have to ask, like, were you a mama boy or a daddy boy? You know, I, I was a say to myself kind of boy. Like, um, I was one of the kids that um, was, you know, playing with my toys, my G.I. Joe's, and I wanted to just kind of be to myself and I had a real big imagination, so I was one of the kids that people would consider the quiet one, and you know, and I probably some people probably would have thought I was weird, but you know. <laughs> but the give or take, I would probably say, um, yeah, that would be it. I would say I kind of stayed to myself, but I mean, of course, I love my mom to death, and you know, later on, me and my father, you know, got through even to be even tighter, so. That. When you were young, did you see a lot of bullying, and what part did you play in the process? You know, I did see a lot of bullying, um, and I can honestly say um, I was more so the one of the the funny guys. You know, made everybody laugh and have a good time. So that particular you know character and i like to say character because no matter what city you're in whatever school you have the same kind of characters of you know characteristics of people um but you know those the people who have everybody having a good time usually don't get bullied but um i could say that um i, I played both sides there's been times to where um, I was built fully, and I had to step up and defend myself. Um, there were times to where I didn't even realize I realized that I was actually bullying somebody. Um, and I never forget after the um, actual incident happened, I felt horrible, and I went back and apologized um, to the young guy. And that was, you know, we were cool after that. But um, so I can say I've seen both sides. I've actually stuck up for kids. The first time I was bullied, it was by a, um, there were some older guys in junior high, and we were in elementary, and they would catch the bus, the bus um, from our school and walk home as we were walking home, and they, one guy in particular would always pick on this other guy who, was, um, he was, he took like the, um, the special need classes and things like that, but he was a real cool guy. And um, they would pick on him, and one day I just asked the guy, I said, hey, um, you guys are in junior high, do y'all have anything better to do than to pick on us? You know, like, and at that point I became the target, and it shifted it off of him, and, you know, um, at that point, you know, there was times where they, the guy would fight me, and, um, but, I mean, so I would say, yeah, all the way around, I've defended him, I've um, been one and didn't realize it, and, you know, seen it a whole lot. Oh, so, alright, for those that don't know, what is it like being one of the top producers in ATL? <clears throat> oh, man, it's, um, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's no sleep. It's, you know, constantly, you know, I'm also a father to three kids and a husband, so I'm always, um, always running. Um, I also have five other companies that have companies overseas um, and also with Bridge the Gap which is actually a textbook that's in schools throughout the U.S. And we actually, you know, teach our 
youth about bullying and how to, you know, just really control their anger. Um, so really from touring from schools and then, you know, scoring movies and all these other things, there's not much time for sleep. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just thankful that, you know, thank God that I love what I do. So that makes it all, you know, work. So what type of personality do you have if people are looking to mentor you? What kind of, so you're saying if someone wanted to mentor me, what would I consider my personality to be? No, if someone wants to mentor you, what type of personality would they have to have? Oh, to mentor you. Um, for one, they would have to, um, the biggest thing is you have to really care. You have to have a heart. I see so many of my peers and other people who, you know, they may on Thanksgiving get some turkeys out or they may give a couple of toys away on Christmas, but that doesn't really, you know, but, that doesn't, but you know, that's only two days out of the year, you know, so what are you doing to actually serve and make a difference, you know, besides that in every day? So on my end, I think one thing that people are able to see is that they're like, wow, this guy is a Grammy-nominated multi-platinum producer who's worked with Jay-Z and everybody, but this guy took two years off of music and spent over a million dollars of his own money to create a book that's actually in schools helping us persevere and work through problems that we have. So with that, you know, people now are in a place to where they can, um, you see it, it's not just talk, you know, and I feel like with everybody, you know, when you have people come to the school and mentor and talk to you, a lot of times, you know, you can tell when somebody's not real. Or you can tell when someone really doesn't care, but they're just giving the hope, hey, I made it, and if I can do it, you can do a speech. You know, so it's really about, it's really your heart is the biggest thing. Because if a person is not real, you know, the youth will, will you know, uh, uh, spot it out immediately. So, I mean, like, I know that you work with a lot of big time artists and like what does the artist need to have for them for you to work with them? Like what qualities? You know, the good thing the good thing about being a producer is they don't really um they don't I mean, I end up really taking that artist and that raw talent and producing it to be something great. You know, and it's a difference from beat makers who just make a beat and say, Okay, here an actual producer. So typically, I've, I've worked with artists, and I won't call them out to make them feel crazy, but I've worked with artists that almost had no talent, but they're top, they're top artists right now in the, on the market, and I have to really make them sound good, you know. So, I mean, if it's a major artist and the label that, you know, paying to get it done, then just like any job, you have to make it sound great, but if it's an artist like up and coming, then what I would look for is really more so passion and drive and that, you know, focus and of course some talent, but you know, we can always, you know, that's what producers are here for, to make the good things sound great and be, you know, just the best they can be, so. So, Mr. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead, finish. No, I'm, I'm finished, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Mr. Bernard said, we will be connecting with you guys regularly. We would love for you to bring some of your artists you work with to be part of the 740 via satellite or when they are in Dallas. Okay. That would be really cool. I would enjoy that. I'm sure they will too. So, and we'll, and we'll definitely be in touch. I mean, we'll definitely be working together a lot. I'm looking forward to it. So, Mr. Andre, do you have any questions for him? Uh, no, pretty much he's answered all the questions. I mean, I'm just happy to be on the same spotlight as Mr. Kale, so I'm good. <laughs> I know it's I know it's work. So, you have any questions? Do my part. I have most of the questions. I just like to add, like bullying, like it's very very long, and everybody in the world has experienced it. Some has experienced it like a lot more. Like, like he said, he's been through it. He's been in it before. Like, everybody has been impacted from that, and uh, it's just a really, very, very, very a blessing for uh, some people to come overcome that over the years and uh, help right. people, uh, you know, fight against it. And uh, 
this is a really good thing. Right. And, and if you guys don't mind, I would love to drop a, a quick little tip on uh, with bullying being the topic today and just kind of share one or two quick things of how I teach, you know, as bridge the gap in the schools, how we really work through helping the bullies, um, you know, recognize what they're doing, but also help the people that's being bullied. Um, and there's a particular chapter in our book that, um, that I wrote that's called, um, that particular chapter is about um, anger, anger management, and just because we could really talk about bullying all day, but to get to the root of the problem, in a lot of cases, the root of the issue is anger. And you and it's people who aren't actually, they haven't learned how to control their anger and realize that your anger, anger is a natural response. It's, you know, you, in most cases, it's that adrenaline that's needed, and it can be healthy in some ways, but at the same time, you know, anger can also channel in a whole nother way if you can't control it. So it's very important for anger to be your servant and not your master, the way it doesn't control you. And in most cases, um, I also talk where a lot of the people that are being bullied, they don't realize it, but it's, it's, all, it's from the past issues. Like, I like to use, it's like helping them get over their past. And I'll give you a, a quick example. Let's say it's a kid who all his life people picked on him and called him a punk or something like that and let's say later on in life he's kind of grown up and he's hanging with some of his friends and then all of a sudden they're joking and everything's cool and then one of the friends calls him a punk and then he gets very angry out of nowhere and they're like well where'd that come from it was because you know but it was because something from in the past that 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 person never got over and it caused them to to lash out that way so you know, a lot of times, you know, I explain to our youth that, you know, a problem isn't yours unless you make it yours. And a lot of times people with those issues, they're hurting and they want to get it off of them and get it on to somebody else so they don't have to feel the pain that they're going through that they haven't gotten over. So um, when you acknowledge that, it kind of, you know, it helps the person bullying, you know, look at things in a different perspective to really work on them because there's nothing macho and cool about bullying and it really means that the person bullying has an inner issue so uh, I hope that you know some of that I don't want to carry on forever but I hope some of that kind of resonated you know and it, you know meant so well to your listeners so Mr. Kale um like you said bullying is our topic today and we're having a round table so would you like to be a part of it um Sure, I get sure. It would be nice to have you on there. Thank you. That would be cool, definitely. Alright, we're gonna have a two minute commercial break with DJ Dog D. DJ take us out.
people have a lower self-esteem. And I'm not talking about the person that's getting bullied. I'm talking about the person that's bullying. Because if you're bullying somebody else, then that kind of shows how you feel about yourself. So you just do that to get like a momentary high. So you'll know that I'm above this person. There's nothing he can do to dispute it. There's, there's different types of bullying. You got play bullying, like Manjabari, or they call me LeBro. I don't know where the name is, bro. But that's, that's not serious bullying, you don't take it personally. Then there's serious bullying where they take it personally and they commit suicide. And I just think it all depends on how you treat other people every day. Yeah. And like I want to add to that, like when you, when you're bullying, like there's different types okay. of bullying, and one type of it is like, when there's a group of people laughing at you. I mean, even if you're not the one making jokes, when you're laughing, you're helping like you're helping like the commotion, like you're helping him feel bad about himself. So you're not, yeah. So you're not really hurting. I mean, you're not really helping him. You're just hurting him. You're just bringing him down even more. So you got to be aware of that. Like not in, even if you're not trying, if it may be funny, I mean, just walk away and tell the person to stop. But you got to find a way to stop the bullying. And just to piggyback on what they said, man, I think that these days, you know, bullying is taken on a whole different level. You know what I'm saying? When I was young in school, uh, I was bullied. I wasn't as big as I am now. I was one of the smaller guys. I was also a pretty artsy guy. I also played football. I was still kind of artsy. I love music and things. So I went on with the choir boy thing. You know, they called me choir boy. I did this and that. And so it was a form of bullying. I took it and it like went off my back. But these days, kids, it seems like the kids are built differently. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, it like, like Isaac said, it's taking on a whole different level to where these kids are going to just uh, kill, you know, kill themselves. You know what I'm saying? It's just crazy. So, uh, I want to take a hold on real quick. Like, we want to know, Mr. K.O., can you hear us? Um, I'm trying, but not, not, not good. Um, can you hear us now? Yeah, I hear you a lot better. All right, then. So, did you have something to say? Hey, you... Oh, yeah. Isaac, Isaac. Yeah. You got to, are you hearing what I'm telling you? You're not paying attention. I'm paying attention. No, you're not. I told you. I said when when, when you go when you go home, you got to do it the way I asked you to do it. If you're not doing the way I asked you to do it, it's not going to work out. I'm doing everything you asked you, you do. interrupted him though. Gee, I'm telling you. Yes, you interrupted him about what what I told you not to do. Gee, don't interrupt. Cut to me. Cut to me. Cut to me. That's lie. I told you not to. Hey, hey, hold on, hold on. You doing exactly what? You tell the show not to do. You pulling him down. Hold on, bro. This is my son. It baby. don't matter your no son or not, man. Hold it don't on, matter. That's why I'm here. No, I'm here hold because hold on, of hold bullying, on. man. Hold on, hold on, hold on. They're going to say, how can you have a show here and you doing the same thing here? Bro. I was telling you backstage how intelligent this young man is. I was son. telling you that. It don't matter, man. It don't matter if oh, your you son gonna, or not. You're going to talk to me a different guy. And I'm going to talk to you like I want to talk to you. You're going to bully your son. It don't matter, man. It don't matter. Let's go. Now keep it rolling. He didn't know that. What you mean I need to know he that? He didn't know that parents can bully too. I don't He's bully telling you. He's not telling me, man. What you talking about? I'm going to tell you this, man. Stand up, young man. Stand up right now. Listen. Do you like the way he's talking to you right now? Do you like the way he's talking backstage? Do you feel funny or not? Exactly what I'm trying to tell you. He went through it. I went through it. And all these kids going through it. I told you backstage, man. You got to be easy with these kids. Now, we're going to make this show work. Just keep it rolling. We're going to make this show work. we got to make sure all of them comfortable. And we ain't going to do them like that. That's why we're here today. My kids are here. And they want to see this stuff stop. He's right, man. I mean, I was about to leave, but he's right. I mean, I'm just saying he's right. Man. Don't put on a show for a show. Let it be what it's going to be. This young man, I told you backstage, that he's timid, man. Be easy with it. Now step back behind me. What do you mean I keep putting him? What do you mean? Okay, guys. Is it mom here? Come on, give him some love like you need to. Go with the boss, son. Okay, guys. My boy, come on. That's not cool, man. Okay, guys, let me share let me share with you something. Come here, come here, brother Lawrence. Come here, brother. Come here, brother Burke. This was put on because of you. There are parents who are bullying their children. 
Just like this reenactment right here. Right. Oh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I'm gonna let you guys know, man. I'm gonna let you guys know. Yeah, please. Oh, oh, my God, man. coming from the kids. They're coming from the parents. And we have to do better when we communicate with our kids. We have to be patient with our children. You did a great job, by the way, son. <laughs> Some things we have to do for shock treatment. But the whole purpose, when you, see these, when you see these intelligent men up here, when you see these adults up here, when you see these intelligent youth up here, we have to take notes. We have to listen to what it is that they're saying. We have to understand where it is that they're coming from. And if you see that your child, if you're talking to your child like this, I guarantee you, your child is the one who's bullying these kids at school. Wow. And it has to stop. Stop. Let me do this. Yes. So I have a question for Isaac. Did you know about this? I oh, am. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I'm back So, Mr. Kale. You still there? Mr. Kale. I'm here. <laughs> what did you think? I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to be honest with you. I was like, whoa, time to go, you know, because they were so realistic. What did you just think about the enactment of uh, a father, as a parent doing their own child? I mean, I think that was... I thought that was very creative. I thought it was real in there. I was like, man, I, you know, I just, uh, I just put the phone on mute and said, okay, this is, this is, this is real life. Y'all had me fooled, but, um. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's funny because it, uh, as far as bullying is concerned, you know, I was going to ask you earlier about bullying. We talked about bullying the kids. What about being in the industry? If I may ask a question, is there any bullying going on in the industry that you're in? Oh, all the time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, oh, no, I bullied a guy one time in my life, man. Uh, <clears throat> I'll never forget. I had to be in like sixth grade. I had, and um, guy was walking down the street, man. I was a little bit bigger than what he was, you know what I'm saying? I kept messing with him, pushing him in his back. Just had me and my crew, you know what I'm saying? I kept messing, pushing him in his back. He kept, stop, stop, whatever. And I don't know what happened, man. He just got this courage, man, to just turn around, just bust me on my face, you know. And after that, I was like, oh, no. And he just like, come on, get, i never forget the words he said. Come on, get some of this golden glove. And he just got this sick. And you know what I did? I said, nah, bro, I don't want no more. You know what I'm saying? So I agree with what you said at first, Mr. Kevin, about is it the people that are doing the bullying, it's something deep within them. And I've seen where you touch that, whatever it was deep within them, you touch you touch what it was deeper than them. And uh, when you touch what it was deeper than them, it seemed like once you did that, the bullying kind of stopped. And I think that was pretty much the situation. So, but like I say, bullying is taking on a whole different meaning these time, these days and times. No doubt. And uh, I have a story of bullying. Uh, when I was younger, um, I remember I had, I had a big bully. And uh, I had to fight him the next day. Oh, now, wow. It was funny because my mom was like, why is he walking out with this big, uh, uh, what's that, uh, no swimming vest? I had it underneath my shirt because I didn't want to get hurt. <laughs> so I said, if he hit me in my gut, if he hit me in my stomach, I'm not going to feel nothing, but I'm going to be able to sock him back. So as I'm trying to leave out the house and rush out before my mom can see me, my mom was like, baby, what is that? What are you wearing? And I'm like, mom, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm about, I'm about to go out to go to school, you know what I'm saying? I just got, I grew in my chest area a little bit. Wow. Overnight. So it was funny, but um, I didn't go fight that bully that day. But um, as I grew older, I learned that, you know, uh, a lot of people, when they're bullying, it's something inside, like everybody else is saying, that is uh, missing. It's, uh, whether they're missing, uh, it's, it's something missing in their, in, their, in, their, um, in their energy levels. It's something negative. So that negative energy is, uh, is very incoherent with their heart. Because God rules over the heart, right? So that means that whatever that whatever that incoherence is, is causing an uh, imbalance. Which means that that imbalance is causing them to bully. Because they're trying to find that balance, that balance point. So what they do is they do it in the best of their abilities. So that means that if they have to go out there and talk about other people, then that's what they have to do to bring that balance in. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I had learned. And then in the ninth grade, I remember trying to help everybody so I can at least help out and cause peace. And ninth grade, I was bullied. I went in, uh, went to school, I was in gym, and they had this big buff football player coming out to me. I'm running from this little skinny kid. They set up the whole thing. So when I'm running, the, the, the big dude tackled me. But at this point, I knew to this dude. So they didn't know that. So when he picked me up, the big dude was like, yeah, I'm bigger than him. I, I can control, I'm stronger. And I was like, oh, okay. So I, I did a little uh, a move to get out of the gym. And everybody was trying to figure out, how did this little kid, like Kevin Hart, break out of this, a dude this size, right? I broke out and they was like, in awe. They was like, Greg is crazy. How, how do you even try to get out of that? And then I told him to back off unless you want to fight. And they was like, wow. He said that right in his face, no fear, nothing. And it was, it was, it, after that, nobody messed with me in school. So it was like, Greg gonna best break out. Because he's a top football player at the school. And I was in Siegelville. We probably went in the start of, But that's one of my stories. This guy here, uh, this is your son. So we heard earlier on the segment, you know, how you were talking about your son. He, you know, he had some bouts with bullying. How did you, now, you look really realistic a while ago. I was like, dude, this dude is serious. We're going to have to get him from the back and, you know, get him. But how did you deal with it as a parent? You know what I'm saying? How did you deal when your son, see, I never had sons. So, uh, uh, and my daughter's six now. So she doesn't really experience the bullying and things of that nature. But how did you deal with your son coming to you? And uh, talking about some bullying and things, and how did you as a parent deal with it? Well, I, I, I tried to cut it off early because, uh, believe it or not, I went through some bullying issues when I was growing up. And I made a point uh, to, to develop this program, Power Cardio, because of bullying and to build myself up so if somebody saw me, I'd look intimidating and leave me alone. So, what I did was, I said, when my son uh, came up, I ever had any son, they come up and make sure I cut that off early. So uh, when he was coming up, um, he had some issues. Oh, oh, when he was coming up, he had some issues with bullying. 
and I decided to uh, to stop it immediately. And, and I, uh, I what I did was I uh, I had two about two brand new truck expedition, and I went and he was living with his mom over in uh, Richardson, Texas, and I drove over there every day for four years to make sure that he didn't get bullied and get treated wrong. Still, it wind up him getting bullied over there, but I was doing some of the things that stay in his life to make sure that he didn't get bullied, but there was some time when he got bullied and uh, I wasn't there, you know, uh, busted his nose and knocked a couple of teeth out of his mouth and things like that. So it was hard on me as a parent seeing that happen, but my thing was to connect this bullying thing to health. And I told him one time some kids jumped on him and I went over there and I was all upset. And I went by the mom's house and I was in the dad's house, whoever. And even though I knocked on, wasn't nobody there. Every kid that bullied my son, when I went to the house and knocked on the door, there wasn't no parents there. And, then, and I started saying, you know what? There's no parents. And these kids are living on their own. So what I'm going to do is, I told son, my son, I said, listen. I said, I'm going to build you up when you be bigger than me, stronger than me, and won't nobody want to mess with you because you're so intimidating they leave you alone. And I said, if I can build myself up or build the people around me up where they can be intimidated to the people that's trying to hurt them, I've done my job. Wow. What, what I think it is, you realize every time somebody gets bullied and they stand up, the, the bullying stops. So I think it is that the person that's getting bullied, just stand up for yourself. I'm not saying go out, get a gun, or shoot the guy that's bullying you. I think it's like speak up for yourself and then it may not be done the first time, but eventually they're, they're going to stop bullying you because they realize he's not a joke. Let's stop it. But it's, it's not it's not as easy as that. It takes time. Because I've been bullied before. I know how it feels when somebody's constantly messing with you. And I have some of my friends, like you guys, come across me telling me that I'm too uptight, that I always have an attitude towards you guys. But that's an effect on being bullied. After you're bullied for a while, you get the sort of feeling, if you mess with me, I'm going to do something back. I'm not taking no more mess from you. I'm going to make myself look big, even though it's obvious I'm a lot smaller than you. But that don't mean I'm scared of you. So. When, when you're constantly being bullied, the people that's doing the bullying are the people that can stop it. Because you notice no kid really goes to a counselor and tells him all their problems. And if there does, if, and if they do, there's always more than one kid. And there's one counselor per person. Not not per person, there's one counselor per school, maybe two. So that can't help out the, the whole school. So the school is always complaining about how there's so many fights, so much conflict. That's because the kids are uptight. They say they're doing something about the bullying, putting the, the bullies in detention and suspending them. That's causing more anger on them. They got to go home and deal with the people that's bullying them at home, their parents. And they come back to school with more anger. So they let it out on these other kids, and these other kids decide to fight back. Not all of a sudden the school's all bad because they have the, they have the most fights in the district or something. And that's all effect on the parents. So that really it, it really doesn't work out as well as standing up and fighting back. You can come up to me and punch me in my face if you're a bully and I probably won't do nothing the first time. But after a while, I'm gonna tell you, you hit me again, I'm gonna do some damage. And it's not that easy for them to let go because after they bully you for such a long time, they don't believe that you're gonna be the one to fight back. So you fight back the first time, what they do? They come back and bully you again. You fight back the second time, they probably start easing up on you. They wanna let you in close. And after you get in close, they still got a grudge on you. Like, like I said, I'm uptight because I've been bullied. I know how it feels. I don't like people coming across me the wrong way. I don't like taking mess with nobody. So if you come across me the wrong way, I may see it all as he has an attitude with me. He doesn't like me. He wants to come across me this way, and he want to, he, he want to start beat. I don't want to have no beef with you. I don't want to fight unless you want to fight. And if you want to fight, you're going to keep bullying me. So that always comes from the perspective of their parents bullying the kid. Yeah, so um, it seemed like all of, all of the this is starting from the parents and the parents have the effect of like stopping this. So it starts at the home. So if the parents can like make sure they're not being a bully towards their kids, then the kids won't have this anger. The kids won't go get uh, put it on other kids at school. But um, Mr. K.O., how do you feel about this? Mr. K.O., are you there? Here. I'm here. Yeah, so how do you feel about the situation? Like, the parents need to, uh, it starts in the home. The parents need to stop the bullying. I mean, I agree 100%. I think that, um, you know, the parents need to stop the bullying. We are all part of the people all the time. We're all in the same perfect world. We have people surrounding the problems that we 
say change that, and then we end up building these fear, these these invisible walls of protection from fears that we have from how we're raised. So um, there's never really a perfect model of a, any parent of knowing how to raise their kids. They just go off of what they were, how they were raised, and um, a lot of times that. That damage is, you know, it always got to the kids. And, they, and, you know, it's almost like that life, if we were to simplify life, it's almost like we have these fears that get built up due to how we were raised, and then we spend the rest of our life trying to knock those walls down to, you know, get to a place of inner peace and feeling good before we leave. So I think it's all about that. And the unfortunate part is a lot of times the parents are are the ones that you can't, that's not easy to change. So it's, it, you know, it puts the power back into our youth and realizing more so that don't, I mean, don't let people, um, don't look at that person when they're wrong, when they're doing things, because in a lot of cases, they don't know any better. They're just, you know, I guess it's kind of like, just because a person is a parent or older doesn't mean they're more mature in certain cases. And because you're, you know, as you, you're you're able to grow more and sometimes parents are stuck in their own way. So sometimes you can, at least, you may not be able to stop the bullying, but you can at least have a different mind state to where if someone comes at you wrong, you don't take it personal because you can flip your mind and make it seem as if it was a little kid arguing with you, you're not going to take it to heart if the kid was arguing with you. And in most cases, if someone's in an immature mind state and they're laughing out at you, you have to look at them as a kid at that moment. Um, so that's just a tool that, you know, that can be used as well. Because in a perfect world, we snap our fingers and the adults get it, and they come to their kids and say, you know, I was wrong and I'm going to be better. But in most cases, it doesn't work that way, you know? What? What I also think it is, they say go to the counselor and tell the counselor. But what, what it's only doing is making it worse because if the bully finds out that you went to the counselor, mm -hmm. he's just going to go get his friends and they're going to get their friends and they're just going to go all out on you because you went to the counselor. Mm -hmm. So what I think it is, don't, I'm not saying don't go to the counselor, but just tell if it's like a school known bully, just say, keep it anonymous. Don't say, oh, he, she came to me and told me that you've been bullying people. Don't say that because that is going to make the, get the bullier mad, more mad than he already is. And he just going to start bullying even more people than before. That's, that's, a, that's a true fact. I don't know how many times I went to the counselor and told them that I was being bullied. And the bully found out and then he'll just get... He just like, you know, you know, you snitched on me, you know, you, you told on me, you know, you don't beat you up more. It just happens all the time. But you we gotta end this one. You, you can't end bullying, we gotta we gotta semi we gotta we gotta lower it down to a to a rate where all these kids aren't afraid to wake up and uh and, and go to school. They can't sleep at night because they, they're they're scared of, of going to recess and having fun because their their bully's gonna be there or going to class because being afraid, you, you don't want to be afraid of going to school. You want to go to school, see your friends. You want to learn, see your teachers, and you want to, you want to get better and you want to learn. I mean, you don't want to be scared. So we got kids watching all over the world live right now. Just if you're bullying, just stop it. Stop all the bullying. Tell if, if you see somebody bullying, step up to them and tell them, hey man, that's not cool. You know, let them know that that's not good, and, and just let them let them feel that that they're doing something wrong. I don't care how old they are, just let them know and just. Your parents too, if they're bullying, just, just we gotta limit, we gotta limit this, and because it's hurting a lot of people all over the world, and it, and it's gotta, it's gotta, we can't end it. We just gotta, we gotta lower it to a rate where it's just a happier, happier environment for everybody. Yeah, I want to talk, I want to talk to our listeners about, you know, and I want to move the whole discussion on how do you deal with bullying, because there's different ways to deal with it. You know, you can go to a counselor, but like at the end of the day. <coughs> Embrace yourself. It's all about embracing yourself. You know, a lot of people tell me it's like, and I told them I deal with bullying still to this day. It's like, oh man, just just because you could be the coolest person, but like, Savion could 
get any any girl he wants or he's at oh, you know but that doesn't matter because I you know I still face it it doesn't matter like if even if you, even if you're as big as these dudes it doesn't matter you can still be mentally and emotionally bullied right. and I and I remember uh, you know I went through this experience where people were like oh man you light skin or you know you ain't no real nigga but you know you're right because I I'm not a nigga. I'm just a brother, I'm an intelligent brother, and I go through these things, it just only makes me stronger. So I never, uh, I never just promoted the fact, I was like, oh, I'm a nigga, I'm just black, I'm African American, that's what I am. But you know, that's funny, man, that's funny that you said something, you just said something very profound. You know, you said mental and physical bullying. See, most times people, when they think of bullying, like this gentleman, this young sir here said, they think of physical bullying. So, mental and physical, so we, we're trying to attack this thing on two fronts. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Oh, good. We have over 6,000 viewers watching this right now. And as I like to say, um, we got. I think we got to deal with the bullying with the bullies because there's always going to be that one big bully that has the soft heart. So you can go tell him. This kid over here is bullying him. He's bigger and stronger than everybody. He may not be bullying on the little kids, but I'm sure if you get to his heart, he will let the other bullies know. You got to back off this kid. You got to back off that kid, and they're not going to do nothing back. And in the end game, that big bully with the soft heart is going to be just like an ordinary kid, not bullying other people. Like, have you seen those clips where it's always the bullying ceremonies at school where they show you, uh, these are the effects of bullying. This kid commits suicide. This kid cuts her. So this kid drops out of school. The most of them is dropping out of school, commit suicide, and cutting himself. That's not that. That's a cause for more bullying. You cut yourself. People see that. Oh, this girl cut herself. Why you do that? Why you do that? Why you do that? That causes them more insecurities, and then they keep coming back for more and more. That leads to the suicide. But if they don't want to commit suicide, they drop out of school. They always talk about how people with brains that that rate is low. Well, it's probably because they've been bullied in high school. You don't never see no person that's dropped out of school all the big and bad like they show in the movies. The football players, it don't work that way. The football players are the ones who stay in because they get the full ride scholarships. So I, I think we got to stop the bullying with the bullies. What, what I think it is, there's two things. Bullying starts it and starts and ends with how much confidence that you have in yourself. If you have more confidence, you realize people don't really get bullied. There's a, there's a time everybody was bullied. I was bullied in elementary, but I really didn't take it no way because I was like, oh, they're just kids. I didn't take it seriously. I just laughed and went on. But if you're more confident in yourself, then you realize those type of people never get bullied. Like the funny people, the people that just crazy, not crazy, crazy, but in a funny way, crazy. They never get bullied. They, they, bullying is like a shark when it smells blood. The blood is your self-confidence. If it knows that it's leaking and it's low, then the shark and the bully is gonna come after you. So that's what I think you're on. All right, so that's it for the youth round table. Keep it for right here, sports talk right there. Oh, we have the sports talk right here. So. Yep. Talking about sports. No, no, no. The the picks of the week. This Kevin way. has opened. All right. So yeah, I saw. I mean, Mr. Kale has to go. So we want to thank you, Mr. Kale, for like. <laughs> yeah. So Mr. Kale, we would like to thank you for like tuning in with us and like sharing it, sharing your information with us. Man, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for letting me hang out, hang out with you guys a little bit here and there on roundtable discussion. And um, you guys, you know, feel free to go to um, bridgethegap.org. That's on bridge, D A gap.org. And we also have our phone app, Bridge the Gap phone app. So just go look for it. And I look forward to hearing from all of you guys. All right. Thank you, bud. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we have the sport picks of the week. Obviously, I'm going to go first, and then y'all can work out how it's going to go. Yeah, it's a lot of it. All right, so first, Carolina versus Seattle. I have Seattle 
Marshawn Lynch is doing good. Russell Wilson is doing good. Seattle really doesn't have a premier wide receiver that they would like to have or that they had in Preston Hardman before they traded him. But Carolina, they're good. Uh, Carolina and Seattle, their games have been close lately. But I think what's really what it's really gonna come down to is the 12th man. The the Seattle's home field advantage is just crazy. Earthquakes and everything have been called. So I got Seattle. Well, I gotta say, uh, as far as Carolina, Seattle, or the other picks, which one are you talking about? Carolina. I, I gotta go with I gotta go with Carolina. And, uh, the reason why I have to go with Carolina because. Uh, yeah, they may have a 12th man in Seattle, but I think that Carolina has peaked at the right time. And it's all about peaking at the right time. And they have been proven, it's been proven that Seattle can be beat with the 12th man. I'm not going to go say how it's been proven, we'll talk about that later. But it's been proven that Carolina, I mean, Seattle can be beat with the 12th man. So in that game, that matchup, I want to pretty much think, I think Cam's going to pull it out, man. He's going to do a lot of things in that, that number 28 guy. I forget his last name. Stewart, I think his name is. Jonathan Stewart? Yeah, I think they're going to come. I think they're going to, they're going to stop the beast mode. And I think they'll, they'll, I think they'll love sexy out today. Um, I, I'm sorry, but I'm going to get you on this one. I mean, Carolina got this one. And really, I mean, it's going to be a good game. I think this, like, we might be real, real tight. But Carolina, I think. Uh, Cam Noon, I think he might do something this game, like really do something. Who, who me? Everybody uh, with the mics. Oh, oh God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, about the picks. Uh, we know you don't know nothing about sports. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I'm not about to go with Carolina since it's two against one. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, you know, you know, the players are. <laughs> um. I don't know about sports either, but I'm gonna have to go with my brother Isaac because I know he knows his sports. Oh, so I'm gonna have to go with what's the team say I don't know. We're gonna get sick of it. Ain't nothing wrong with a little laugh. A little laugh is good for the soul, right? Right, um, right, right? Well, I'm gonna go with um Carolina. I think Cam Newton's been playing great. But Carolina in their last game they played the uh, the Cardinals, I think. And I don't think that really was Carolina was really to be able to show how they played because Carolina, I mean, Arizona was playing with like their fourth string quarterback. So we'll see in the game. I say Seattle. I think Marshawn Lynch is going to run straight up the middle of the whole game. If not that, they going he he gonna run to the outside or something. But I know he gonna get the ball. But I'm saying Seattle. I got Seattle, man. Rich, well, Russell Wilson has shown he can play in the playoffs and he can do really well. As it, uh, Cam Newton hasn't really been in the playoffs, you know, he got him to win. But, you know, that defense is scary. Everybody knows the 12 man defense. Richard Sherman, you know, all those guys back there. And I think they're going to just pick Cam Newton apart. Right now, I'm a straw because I'm a Steeler fan, so. I'm, 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 in a, I'm in the zone right now. But I'm going to go with uh, Seattle, like I say, at, at 12th man. So I'm at uh, Carolina. I don't have, the, Carolina don't have too, much, too much experience. And they ain't been in the playoffs like, in years that they've been. <laughs> yeah, we can't remember it, but that 12 man is hard to beat down there. Early quick, like he was saying, and all that stuff like that. So they're going to take a bag of that 12 man, and they're going to win. So I got Seattle. I think I want to change. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I want to change. I'm going to Seattle now. Oh, I'm going to Seattle now. I'm going to Seattle. All right, so Ice, what's the next game? Pick of the week. Baltimore versus New England. Who you got? I have New England. Um, I, I do know a little bit about Baltimore, and I do know a lot of, uh, I, when I was up in the Air Force, all they talked about was Baltimore and New England, Cowboys, and all those teams, I love the Cowboys because it's my home city, you know what I'm saying, so I always went to Team Cowboys, no matter what they said, they used to always, you know, a little playful bully, play with my hard hats because I always had a Cowboys hard hat, and there was a lot of New England, so uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, New England. Um, yeah, I don't like this one. I'm agreeing with Isaac. Um, I mean, New England gonna win. I mean, I really believe that they just got this game in the bag, so New England got this. I agree. I gotta go with Baltimore, man. I gotta go with Baltimore because Baltimore has a, a tough defense and they have a, a resilient quarterback also. I'm not saying New England doesn't, but I just think the New England era is over. You know, I think it's time for Baltimore to rise up again on that side of the ball. No, I think. 
We'll see. Yeah. Better I'm, offense. I'm, I'm, and a better offensive line. I'm going to go with the Patriots. It's just down there in New England in cold weather and, and the rebels on their side, everybody loves Tom Brady. So I'm going to go with the Patriots. <laughs> Cowboys Nation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> How you so? What? Next Indiana week. Oh. Indiana versus Denver. I have Denver. I have Denver. Enough said. Indiana. Indiana. Cowboys, please win it all. <laughs> uh, I mean, Denver got this. Indiana, they haven't been playing too good this all. Denver got this. All right, next one. Chris, you all know how it's going to go. So, three, we all going to say it. Cowboys versus Green Bay. One, two, three. Cowboys. Cowboys. What? Well, I say, I'm going to tell you why I said the Cowboys versus Green Bay. We got a Green Bay fan back here. Cowboys versus Green Bay. The, the, main, the main matchup is that you have an 8 0 team on the road playing an 8 0 team at home. But that 8 0 team has been blown out at home earlier this year by the New Orleans Saints, who are not even in the playoffs. Right. And they've been beaten by the San Francisco 49ers. And they're not only, not only that, they're playing with a quarterback with a slight calf tear. Maybe, so, maybe. I, yeah, so people are saying that you got to deal with Green Bay's. Uh, offense. Well, Green Bay has to deal with Dallas offense too. So I picked Dallas all the way like you did. All right. So that's it for the show. We'd like to thank our sponsors, STI 740, Power Cardio, Team Lawrence. We'd like to thank yeah. you guys for being here. PPVStream.biz. And before we go, everybody introduce yourselves. And what you do. And what you do. My name is Bertrand Lawrence. I play football at French University. <laughs> name is Andre Lindsay. Uh, co founder of the Spartans Youth Sports Association. My name is Dylan Sanders, and I'm running back for the Spartans. Bertrand Lawrence, Bertrand Lawrence, little brother. <laughs> I'm Gregory Terry, and um, I'm a uh, I'm a I'm a upcoming artist, and I'm also a business owner. And this is my brother. What do you do for the show? Oh, um, I'm just. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Isaiah Cherry. Uh, I do the recording for the show. Excuse me. My name is Brother Savion Curd, and I am the host of the talent segment. And uh, I'm the hype man, too. I keep this show white. Um, I'm Brother Javari Garrett, and you know I'm the co host on the set. I'm Savoy Curry, and I also do the recording for the show. John Mitchell, and I do the poetry to the special guest. Oh, I'm Bert Monson, founder and creator of Power Cardio Team Lawrence. And I'm Mighty Cherry, second best player. I'm the main host. Everybody know that. Good job, bro. <laughs> but thank you for everybody tuning in to STI 720, and thank we you. out. And that's your nation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>